Hello fellow Canadians, I am about to tell you probably the most important news in the history of our country. I pondered for weeks about what are the best words that I can use to give you this news. I considered soft words, I considered mainstream language a la CBC. I thought about harmless metaphors and other tricks of language that might shed an unnatural and rosy light. As a good Canadian, I must start by saying sorry in advance if I may come across as, uh, let us say, abrasive, patronizing, or even too self-assured, I come from an intention of compassion, concern, and deep commitment to the well-being of all Canadians and of all humans. I will tell you the news first, then I will unravel in detail what it means with numbers and meaning for real life. The news contains in itself the possibility of a wonderful and bright future, a great avenue for hope and exhilaration. Canadians will need to fundamentally change their lifestyle very soon in order to contribute to a sustainable life for all humans on Earth. Lifestyle carbon footprints need to drop 82% by 2030 and 95% by 2050. This is the news. I invite you to explore with me what it means. In October 2021, the Hot or Cool Institute in Berlin published a report titled 1.5 degree lifestyles towards a fair consumption space for all. They show how our everyday lifestyles we need to change in order to keep global warming within the 1.5 degrees Celsius, according to the Paris Agreement. By 2050, the maximum carbon footprint, that is CO2 equivalent, for the lifestyle of an average human will need to be 0.7 tons per person per year. Canadians, on average, consume today 14.2 tons per person per year. The report breaks down this consumption into five categories. Food. Canadians consume on average 160 kilograms of meat per person per year. The carbon footprint of food alone is 2.3 tons per person per year. Housing. Large living spaces, gas used for heating, cooking, long winters, all add up to 3.1 tons per Canadian per year. Transport. High share of personal car use and carbon-intensive air travel amount to 5 tons per person per year. Consumer goods generate 2.5 tons and leisure and services generate 1.4 tons for a total of 14.2 tons per Canadian per year. Quick pause for some historical context. This reality certainly has a history and cannot easily be explained away by one single cause. There are many factors at play here. Geography, the colder climate, the history of colonialism, the abundance of resources, the consumerist habits induced into Canadians by capitalism itself, and proximity to the United States, the biggest trading partner of Canada. It is not my intent to use this report to point the finger. We have been dealt impossible cards by history, and many of our powerful ancestors we don't have much choice but to look forward and make the better decisions this time. Let me go over some definitions that are very important for our understanding of the situation. Lifestyle is how we consume and also how we relate to one another, what kind of neighbors, friends, citizens and parents we are, what kinds of values we nurture and how we let those values drive our consumer choices. A fair consumption space is an ecologically healthy perimeter that supports within it an equitable distribution of resources and opportunities for individuals and societies to fulfill their needs and achieve well-being. It lies above underconsumption, which is socially unsustainable, and below overconsumption, that is environmentally unsustainable. Between these two limits is where lifestyles are fair in relation to all people both living now and living in the future. Many people from low-income countries will need to increase their consumption to get there, while many people in high-income countries will need to reduce consumption. This is also what the degrowth movement is all about. 
carbon footprint refers not only to CO2, but also to other greenhouse gases. The report considers emissions of methane, nitrous oxide, hydrofluorocarbons, perfluorocarbons, and sulfur hexafluoride converted into CO2 equivalents or CO2Es. A sustainable lifestyle is a cluster of habits and patterns of behavior embedded in a society and facilitated by institutions, norms, and infrastructures that frame individual choice in order to minimize the use of natural resources and generation of waste while supporting fairness and prosperity for all. I have to move on to unravel the details of the report and the meaning for our daily way of life towards a fair consumption space. As of April 15, 2022, the Climate Emergency Declaration has been signed by 2,094 jurisdictions and local governments in 38 countries and 23 national governments covering 1 billion citizens. It is not just a report from the Hot or Cool Institute saying this, but many cities and administrations agree that we are in a climate crisis and we need to drastically change our way of life. In June last year, Canada broke its temperature records for three straight days, reaching 49.6 degrees Celsius. I wonder how 2022 will be like. Where does this heat all come from? Oxfam estimates that to reach the global average per capita emissions by 2030, to limit heating to 1.5 degrees Celsius, the consumption per individual of the richest 10% of the global population should be reduced to about 10% of their current level while those of the poorest 50% could still increase by two to three times their current level. Yet, this inequality trend is growing bigger, the rich emitting even more. Consumerism by some can only exist if others are deprived of their own livelihoods. Growing extremes in poverty and wealth easily correlate to vast differences in power as well as impacts on the environment. Perversely, it is the poor, those at a power disadvantage, who experience the most dire impacts of climate change. When we talk about a fair consumption space, given that the resources of Earth are limited, overconsumption by one person affects the prospects of another. Achieving a fair consumption space follows three principles, limits, equity, and well-being. Limits are about the finite resources of Earth. We cannot extract forever from the planet. Minerals do not replenish themselves. Equity is about ecological justice. All humans should have access to resources and opportunities. Just like one person has one vote in political democracy, so should one person have equal or equivalent access to resources. Well-being is living a decent life with dignity and reasonable prosperity. This is the scope of a fair consumption space which reminds us of the donut economics model. This means in real life, living on 0.7 tons of CO2Es per person per year. Time for another break. The report examines GHG emissions using consumption-based accounting instead of production-based accounting. Consumption-based accounting covers both direct emissions in a country and embodied emissions of imported goods while excluding emissions embodied in exported goods. This accounts especially for the global impacts of high-consuming societies like Canada. If we look at what people consume where they live, we get a much better picture of their carbon footprint because a car purchased in Toronto contains in it all the minerals excavated all over the world plus the shipping plus production overseas at a cost to the environment. Back to the main story. We can draw some lessons from research on enabling sustainable lifestyles. One, green consumption is not the same as sustainable living. While green consumption and eco-labeled products might be better than conventional ones, buying too many of them is still consumerism. In a sustainable lifestyles transition, we need to provide non-consumption and out-of-market options, and to protect lifestyles of communities already living well without consumerism. Two, the environmental impacts of lifestyles mainly come from four domains, 
food, personal transport, housing, and consumer goods. Eating meat, using fossil fuel cars, flying, and large and high energy consuming houses are especially problematic. There is no universal sustainable lifestyle. What is sustainable in one place may not be sustainable in another. If one must use a car, then an electric car in Iceland might make sense. If one must use a car, then an electric car in Iceland might make sense, where 100% of electricity comes from renewables, but not in India, where electricity is primarily generated from coal. Successful examples of sustainable lifestyles practices should be replicated and scaled in new places only after careful adaptation. For the environmental impacts of lifestyles are not intentional, but rather a consequence of people aspiring to fulfill needs or desires and to function in society. 5. Increasing awareness does not necessarily lead to action. This is difficult to swallow, but some of us cannot and will not act on information like this. This is where government and society can step in and help. 6. The question of individual behavior change versus change the systems is a false dichotomy. Some actions can be done by individuals and some are beyond individual control. They complement each other. 7. Beyond the point of enabling basic needs and a life of dignity, having more money does not directly translate to more happiness. 8. Inequality and perceived unfairness in society is a strong predictor of whether an intervention will fail or succeed. People will accept radical solutions if they are justified and if all bear fair share of responsibility. 9. Lifestyles are not static. Needs are a function of time and place. 10. Sustainable lifestyles are not all about reducing consumption. Social innovations, social movements and grassroots experiments are pivotal in opening up new avenues and engendering acceptability of sustainable solutions. To recap, the report shows we need to aim for a lifestyle carbon footprint of 0.7 tons of CO2Es by 2050, with intermediary target of 1.4 tons in 2040 and 2.5 tons in 2030, which is eight years from now. Canada needs to drop emissions 82% by 2030. This is today and we need to get here in eight years. If we look at food, the 2.3 tons per Canadian per year breaks down like this. Meat lands at 1.39 tons dairy at 0.34 tons. Reminder, we need to get to 0.7 tons in total for all emissions by 2050. That is an enormous stretch for the Canadian lifestyle. This graph shows both the volume of consumption on the horizontal axis and the carbon intensity of the product on the vertical axis. Meat consumption at 160 kilograms per person per year is less than beverages in terms of volume, but it is highly carbon intensive at over 8 kilograms of CO2Es per kilogram of meat. The green line shows where we should be today in 2022. The red line shows where we need to be in 2030. And the blue line shows where we need to be in 2050. Yet this is also great news. This is a great opportunity to reinvent ourselves as a nation. It can be a thrilling adventure, it can be fun and playful, it can be dance and celebration. There's a lot we can learn from the First Nations in our territories. Chimigwech. For your reference, a low-income country at the opposite spectrum of lifestyle emissions, Indonesia, looks like this. They too need to make some little adjustment, however, on a much smaller scale. If I am allowed the friendly pun, this is food for thought. Housing. In Canada, the average living space is 58 square meters per person, the highest among the countries studied. At the opposite end is India at 10 square meters per person. I will not cover the causes of this as we are concerned now only with the consequences. In total emissions from housing in Canada amount to 3 tons per person per year divided between construction, maintenance, electricity, gas, oil 
used for heating. Energy used is also extremely high at 11,500 kilowatts per person per year. The green line is where we should be now in 2022. The red line is where we need to be in 2030. The blue line is where we need to be in 2050. As you can see, we need to drop both the amount of consumption on the horizontal axis and the intensity of consumption, meaning the quantity of CO2 equivalents per kilowatt hour. This obviously means that home heating systems will have to become fully electric and electricity must become fully renewable with zero emissions. In Canada, over 90% of the renewable grid electricity is hydropower and of that 40% is based on pumped hydropower, which has higher intensity compared to natural gas used for heat and power cogeneration. Thus, the average carbon intensity for Canadian grid electricity is twice as high compared to Finland and the United Kingdom, yet only half of Japan's. Personal transport. Canada has a very high transport demand at 22,000 kilometers per person per year. Cars are the biggest contributor to carbon footprint. They alone generate 3.5 tons of carbon emissions per person per year. Canadians do also a lot of flying at one ton per person per year. If we look at amount versus intensity, they are both high. Compare the green line of today with where we need to get in 80 years and then in 28 years. That is a massive reduction both in quantity and in intensity. Not only we need to get rid of all gasoline cars, but we cannot replace each one with an electric car. For comparison, this is how Indonesia looks like, a country of 273 million people seven times bigger than Canada in terms of population. Consumer goods, leisure and services. Canadians have the highest footprint of 3,900 kilograms per person per year, while they spend on average $9,000 per year for this category. Clothes are the highest spending in all countries except Japan. Finance and insurance services are clearly highlighted in all high-income countries. Okay, so we have seen where we are now what we can do to shrink these emissions and change our lifestyle. One method is absolute reduction, which means reducing physical consumption of goods or services consumed, such as food, kilometers driven, energy use, or living space, as well as avoiding unsustainable options. This is the most obvious method. Second is a modal shift, which means changing from one consumption mode to a less carbon intensive one, adopting plant-based diets instead of eating excessive meat, using public transport instead of cars, or using renewable energy for electricity or heating instead of fossil fuels. Third is efficiency improvement, which means decreasing emissions by replacing technologies with lower carbon ones while not changing the amount consumed or used, such as in energy efficient vehicles, appliances or housing. We also need to consider what it's called a rebound effect or the Jevons paradox. Introducing electric cars might increase the total distance traveled by cars or the size of cars, which could potentially upset or even reverse the absolute amount of resource used or emissions because the production of electric cars itself is damaging to nature and causes emissions. Typical electric car requires six times the mineral inputs of a conventional car and an onshore wind plant requires nine times more mineral resources than a similarly sized gas fire power plant. Or think about the locked-in effect. Many consumers are locked in by a circumstance which determines their work and spend lifestyle. This is where governments and businesses need to step up and offset this effect. For example, the government can pass a federal law that allows employees to work from home if the nature of their business permits. Companies will not have the authority to force employees to return to the office and commute long distances. This is the impact of specific lifestyle options in terms of carbon footprint or kilograms of CO2Es per person per year. By far, the vegan and vegetarian options have the highest impact. These are the lifestyle options for housing. Renewable electricity tops the list. We also have electric-based heating, smaller living space, efficient and few appliances, improvements to buildings. All these are in fact not a surprise for many Canadians. I would be surprised 
if it was a surprise. Transportation looks like this. Everything matters from car fee traveling to electric cars and few of them, not one for every person. Less flying, more train rides, more telework. I would like to emphasize that this is not a soft statement. These are major transformative changes like Canada has not seen in its history. It means Canadians have the opportunity to evolve to a higher, better, wiser way of life. What we discussed so far is about individual behavior, choices, decisions. All these cannot happen in a void. We all belong to a nation, to a society. The government will also need to step in forcefully and bravely to help individual Canadians cope with these difficult decisions. We can talk now about policy. First set of policies has to do with what the report calls choice editing, which is a delicate way of saying that carbon intensive options will be removed from the market. A second set of policies is about setting limits for harmful consumption to stay within the carbon budget. The third set of policies is about making an equitable society by establishing a social guarantee from universal basic income to universal basic services. Let's look at these in more detail. Choice editing implies no more single-use plastics, much less plastic objects from toys to tools and many more. We could ban the import of products that cannot be recycled. We could incentivize local manufacturers to only produce recyclable products that generate close to zero waste. Manufacturers can be held accountable for what they produce. The view that establishing consumption limits is against democratic governance and modern systems, ensuring individual rights and freedoms is countered with two arguments by Di Giulio and Fuchs. The first is that the pursuit of the common good is the responsibility of the political community. Those mandated with governing includes the management of commons, which the atmosphere and most natural resources are considered to be. Thus, the design and implementation of consumption limits is a way of guaranteeing the common good, especially when there is scarcity of said resources or risk that there may be irreversibly damaged. The second argument is that since it is the task of the state to prevent discrimination and protect individuals against infringements on their freedom by others, the state has the right and the obligation to prevent individuals from consuming to such an extent that access to sufficient quality and quantity of resources is denied to others. Setting limits is about protecting freedoms. The report details how choice editing can be implemented. I will leave that to the curious reader to discover. I put the link in the description. Next on the agenda is the social guarantee. It combines a variety of policies from an unconditional monthly income paid to each Canadian by the government, also called basic income, to universal services to which we all have free and equal access, from education to healthcare, childcare, transport, libraries, and so on. The social guarantee puts collective consumption on the agenda, alongside individual consumption, to support efforts to avoid breaching planetary boundaries and to constrain excessive and unnecessary consumption. It aims to support a sufficient level of consumption for all through an enhanced social income. The social guarantee embodies an ethos of collective responsibility and a needs-based approach to human welfare based on sufficiency. IPCC also makes a strong case for sufficiency. A few words about sufficiency. Sufficiency is often conceptualized by contrast to efficiency. Efficiency is about the continuous short-term marginal technological improvements, which allow doing more with less in relative terms without considering the planetary boundaries. Sufficiency is about long-term actions driven by non-technological solutions like land use management which consume less in absolute terms and are determined by biophysical processes. The focus of sufficiency is on human needs and the services required for human well-being, while the focus of efficiency is on human wants, such as products and commodities. 
buildings, cars, appliances, energy. In that sense, efficiency is a supply-side strategy, while sufficiency is a demand-side strategy. I think we need to take a break. I would like to show you a piece of paper that was in circulation during communism in Romania. This is a ration card for bread. Each household was allowed to purchase half a loaf of bread per day. You went to the store, they marked the day on the card, you paid, and you got your bread. There was another card for sugar and for oil. Electricity was also rationed. Frequently, the power went out for hours at a time. We read books under candlelight, we told jokes, we socialized. I was old enough to remember the experience. It was frustrating when you had to stay in long queues to get the bread, or when power went out without warning. And back to the main story. The report asks a sensitive question. Has the time come for carbon rationing? What is rationing? It is known under several names. Personal carbon trading, rations, allowances, budgets, quotas, individual carbon allowances, tradable energy quotas. Food rationing was done in the UK during World War II. Water was rationed in South Africa. Electricity rationing was done in Texas in 2021. And it is done in a variety of situations today. When designing a carbon rationing policy, or in other words, how much carbon each person is allowed to use, all these factors need to be considered. Trading. With trading, those with low carbon footprints would have spare carbon units to sell, and those with high emissions would need to buy additional units when their allowance runs out. Say we all get a card with 2,500 points on it, which is the target footprint for 2030, 2,500 kilograms. Every time we buy something that has a footprint of one kilogram of CO2Es, we spend a point from the card. All products and services will have a fixed value in carbon points in addition to their price in dollars. Or we can define bundles of products, fractions of points, and so on. The principle is equal per person allowance. Every adult, poor or rich, gets the same card renewed every year. Just as every adult gets one vote in our electoral system, we are all equal in front of the law and we are equal in front of nature. If you don't use the points, you can sell them. But if you don't use them, you lose them. The alternative to rationing is the carbon tax. Here's a comparison between the two. The rationing will also generate and require a new culture. It is not the culture I lived under communist Romania that was motivated by Ceausescu's obsession to pay off national debt. The culture we need for a new lifestyle to mitigate global warming is that of genuine solidarity and deep committing to values that transcend the present and the individual. It requires a new form of imagination with new freedoms, more local living, less consumption of things, and more consumption of immaterial experiences. Need for both individual and system change in Canada. The current target of 2.5 tons per person per year by 2030 is not met with any adoption rate of options analyzed in the report. Even if Canada has 99% adoption for both intensity and amount. It doesn't mean we are doomed, but it does mean we share one of the heaviest burden of individual responsibility in the world. By 2030, personal transport demand would need to decrease at least a third, which is 6,900 kilometers from the current level and achieve the current intensity of an average electric car in Canada. Changes in the diet, like the vegan diet, and system-focused changes, like more efficient food production, would lead to a dietary footprint of 400 kilograms of CO2Es per person per year, or an 82% reduction from the current level. The overall housing footprint would need to decrease more than half resulting in a footprint of 1,300 kilograms per person per year. The living space per person would need to drop to at most 32 square meters, and the energy consumption would need to drop 30%, 3,400 kilowatts hour, resulting in an intensity of 0 0.16 kilograms per kilowatt hour, which will be close to the average carbon intensity of current hydropower-based electricity production. For others, like consumed goods, leisure, and services, both the intensity and the per capita consumer spending would need to drop drastically. An average person in Canada has the lifestyle footprint 
six times larger than a person in Indonesia. One quick thought which I think is on everybody's mind. Who pays for all this? The answer is long, but in a nutshell. Transition to a degrowth agenda. Progressive wealth tax for Canadians making more than $200,000 per year. Complete end to fossil fuel subsidies today. End to fossil fuel extraction today. And net government spending that does not create inflation. For this, I will need to tell you about modern monetary theory, perhaps some other time. Let us say if high-income countries refuse or are simply incapable to change their lives so drastically, what else can happen? Well, low-income countries will block access to their resources, effectively ending the imperialism at the hand of high-income countries. Europeans, Canadians, Americans will see a sharp drop in their access to t-shirts made in Bangladesh or even smartphones because lithium will be kept in the ground where it is in the global south. Can low-income countries protect their resources against exploitation by the high-income countries? Yes, they have done it already and I certainly hope they will continue to do so. In conclusion, let me quote you the very last paragraph from the report. Be brave. Each delay in taking meaningful action only increases the likelihood of a climate catastrophe, which would make even more drastic actions necessary. There is enough evidence of workable solutions and additional opportunities for experiments with high return potential in terms of climate mitigation to get started right away. My fellow Canadians and all of you around the world, thank you for watching. See you next week. Click here to watch this video or this video to learn more.